there are many troubles in the world, of course, and we, th these are important and we need to solve them. But we also need things that make us ex excited to be alive, that make us glad to wake up in the morning and be fired up about the future and, and think, yeah, the future's gonna be great. You know, and, and this space exploration is one of those things. This is the 11th anniversary of the first time SpaceX re uh, reached orbit. It was actually our, it was our fourth launch. If that launch had not succeeded, that would have been the end of SpaceX. What's really kind of hard to grasp at a visceral level is that this giant ship will do the same thing that Grasshopper did. This thing is going to take off, fly to 65,000 feet, about 20 kilometers, and come back and land in, in about one to two months. The sh ship dry mass would be approximately 120 tons. The initial Mark 1 prototype is, is closer to 200 tons, and the, in series production, um, I think it'll probably be about 120 tons. In terms of its, of its usefulness, it'll be, be able to do about 150 tons with full reusability uh, to orbit and back. The cost of, of, of a fully reusable system is basically the cost of the propellant, which is mostly oxygen. The Falcon architecture is about two and a half tons of oxygen for every one ton of fuel. This is three and a half tons of oxygen for every one ton of fuel. Um, earlier I was talking about how Starship uh, enters and how it's controlled. Um, it's, it's really qu it's quite different from anything else. It's really um, falling. And so we're doing a controlled fall. So with, with a rocket, you're actually trying to break um, as opposed to you're trying to create drag instead of lift. It's, it's really the opposite of an aircraft. You want the most amount of drag that you can produce. Um, and you want some lift, especially when you're in the upper atmosphere, mostly so that you don't, you can control the maximum heating rate. So it comes like this and then starts falling and then just falls like a skydiver. And it's just controlling itself. And then it, it turns and lands like that. Incredibly elaborate explanation. And then you can get a sense for it. This is much better. <laughs> there you go, see? Same thing. <laughs> but it'll look totally nuts to see that thing land. The Starship will have three sea level engines that move up to about 15 degrees angle and three vacuum engines that are optimized for efficiency that will not move. So they will be just fixed in place. And that allows us to have the biggest bell nozzle for the vacuum wrapper engines. Aspirationally, the, the target is a, a 380 second ISP for the vacuum engine. In sort of space geek terms, this is like a really a great number. Ultimately, we decided to have uh, heat shield um, hexagonal ceramic tiles that are basically very light, but very crack resistant. Like, it, like at first, it feels like, oh, it's steel. Does that mean it's heavy? No, actually, it's the lightest construction. This is, steel is the best design decision on, on this whole thing is a 301 stainless steel. At cryogenic temperatures, a 301 stainless actually has about the same effective strength as an advanced composite or aluminum lithium. Unlike most steels, which get brittle at low temperature, 301 stainless gets much stronger. There is another benefit. It also has a high melting temperature. So for a reusable ship, you're coming in like a meteor. You want something that does not melt at a low temperature. You want something that melts at a high temperature. Um, and this is where steel is extremely good as well. The steel ha has a melting temperature around 1500 degrees centigrade, whereas aluminum, maybe 300 or 400 degrees. Um, and same thing for carbon fiber, and that's really pushing it. Having that much higher melting temperature means that you don't need any shielding on the, the leeward side of the, of the ship when it comes in for entry. And, and the shielding you need on the windward side, the hot side, is, is massively reduced because the thickness of the tile is dependent on how hot does the back of the tile that interfaces with the airframe get. And because the steel can take a much higher temperature, your heat shield is much lighter. It's $130,000 a ton for the carbon fiber and $2,500 a ton for the steel. So the steel is about 2% of the cost of the carbon fiber. It's very easy to weld stainless steel. The, the evidence being that we welded it outdoors without a factory. <laughs> this gives you a sense of, of size. Um, so the little pixels there, that's a, little, little pixels are a human. Starship ca ca cannot get to uh, Earth orbit without the booster. So the, the booster is designed to take up to 37 Raptor engines. I'm not sure if we'll go that high. The booster is, is designed to be able to take uh, multiple engines out. We are going to be building ships and boosters at both Boca and the Cape as fast as we can. I mean, it's going to be really nutty to see a bunch of these things. I mean, not just one, but a whole stack of them. The way that Mach 1 and Mach 2 cylindrical sections were built with basically plates. 
so a series of plates to create each cylinder section. With uh, Mark III and beyond, we will literally take the coil of steel from the mill, unspool it, change the curvature to a nine meter diameter, and do a single seam weld. And it would also be thinner, which makes it lighter and cheaper. And we would seek to go to orbit with probably Mark IV or Mark V. I mean, this is gonna sound totally nuts, but I think we wanna try to reach orbit in less than six months. The priority is to build at least uh, two starships at each site, at Boca at the, and the Cape, um, and then start building the booster. The main constraint on launching the booster is engines, because obviously the booster has a lot of engines. Uh, do, doing the, the, the tanks um, and the legs and, say, the grid fins, that is not a constraint. Like, that we can get done fast. I including development engines, from now through, through orbit, we probably need 100 Raptor engines. And our production rate right now is maybe one every eight to 10 days. And then our, our target is to get to a Raptor engine every day by Q1 next year. But an, another key step is refilling on orbit so that uh, the Starship can get to orbit with, let's say, 150 tons of, of payload for the moon or Mars or beyond. It can get tankered to fill up its propellant tanks and so that it, it can depart from low Earth orbit with 1,200 tons of propellant. Your delta velocity is, is enough to transport 150, literally 150 tons to the surface of the moon or Mars. It's actually harder to dock with the space station than it is to do orbital refilling. The pressurized volume on Starship is around 1,000 cubic meters. So if you had 100 people, you'd have 10 cubic meters per person, which is Especially in like a zero G situation, that's actually quite a lot of room. And, and uh, by the way, a thousand cubic meters, I think, is close to what the space station pressurized volume is. You know, Starship is like launching space station uh, pressurized volume on every flight. This is quite a lot. Definitely possible that the first uh, crewed mission on Starship could leave from uh, Boca. To the best of my knowledge, both places will launch uh, crewed missions. We, we think it would be very exciting to have a base on the moon, even if it's just a science base. Whether or not people want to live on the moon, there's definitely a lot of science to be done. The critical thing that we need to focus on, I think, is the fastest path to a self-sustaining city on Mars. As far as we know, we are the only consciousness or the only life that's out there. There might be other life, but we've seen no signs of it. You know, people often ask me, if you, what, do you, what do you know about the aliens and that? You know, I'm like, man, I tell you, if I'm pretty sure I'd know, you know, if there were aliens. I have not seen any sign of aliens. I think we should really do our very best to become a multi-planet species and to extend consciousness beyond Earth. And we should do it now. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.